For the New York Institute for the Humanities, I'm Eric Banks. Over the past two decades, Institute fellow Peter Filkins has dedicated himself to the work of H.G. Adler, a writer who not only survived Theresienstadt, Auschwitz, and two other concentration camps, but devoted himself to telling the stories of those who perished. Now Filkins has published his magisterial biography of Adler, making the full story of his life available for the first time in any language. Filkins is an award-winning translator and poet and the Richard B. Fisher Professor of Literature at Bard College at Simons Rock. Peter, welcome. Thanks, Eric. It's nice to be here. Thanks. You first introduced many people to Adler's work by way of the trilogy you translated for Random House, starting with The Journey, published in 2008, then Panorama, and finally The Wall, published a couple of years ago? 2014. 2014. To many American readers, Adler is perhaps as well-known as a novelist as he is for his other work. Yes. The irony is that though in his lifetime he had difficulty publishing his novels and in fact only published two of them in his lifetime, when I came along and stumbled upon the novels and was able to get them into English, that Adler was first introduced via his novels uh, rather than his seminal work, Third Agents, 1941, 1945, which he published in 1955. The Journey, or as it's known in German, Einreise, he wished to call it Die Reise, wasn't published until 1962, and uh, Panorama was not published until 1968. We got very good reviews. Uh, People sort of pricked up their ears when Adler came along as a novelist. He's a very complicated, complex, uh, I think of as a modernist novelist, uh, and the works resonated with readers and critics alike when, when it came out. Do you have any sense of how to account for that success that Adler found in in English? I think time is is the first factor, that readers and critics in Germany were not ready for a highly aestheticized, modernist, multi-voiced kind of fiction uh, dealing with this material back in the late 50s or early 60s. Uh, We know the famous statement from Adorno that it's barbaric to write a poem after Auschwitz. Peter Sorkamp, the great publisher in Germany, said of Einerleise, as long as I'm alive, this this novel will not be published in Germany, and it proved to be true. Mm. Sorkamp dies in 1960, I believe, Mm -hmm. and the novel comes out in 62. Uh, I think why it resonated here is because the novels are about how to shape the memory of this experience and how to think about this experience almost metaphysically. They're not simple memoir. They're not just autobiography. They are fictionalized, stylized, highly manipulated, if you will, artistically accounts of this experience. Have they already begun to enter the canon in American universities, et cetera, in writing on the Holocaust? Yes. I mean, it it did change. Many conferences were held on Adler in Toronto. We had a little conference up at Bard College, but London, Prague, Berlin, there's been two or three uh, volumes of essays written on his work now. People are beginning to be aware of his novels, and and dissertations are beginning to be written on them as well. I'm going to ask you in a minute how you came to Adler, Mm. because I think it's a a really interesting story. Mm. But just jump ahead a little bit. Was your access point through Sebald? Sebald famously mentions Adler. Um, and, and, of course, yes. for people who don't remember, there was a moment really now 15 years ago, I suppose, where Sebald was, a, was someone everyone was reading, I think. My access point was not. I had read Austerlitz when it first came out in 2001, and I loved and do love uh, Sebald. When I read Austerlitz, towards the end, as we know, uh, this character H.G. Adler shows up when uh, Austerlitz wants to learn more about Theresienstadt. He reads H.G. Adler's book on Theresienstadt. The map in Sebald's novel is Adler's map. But at the same time, when you read it, you think it's just a character that Sebald's made up. <laughs> there was mm-hmm. no reason, and Adler was not well enough known at the time. Curiously, he ends up my entry point because when I did stumble upon Analyza in, a, in Schoenhoff's foreign language bookstore in Harvard Yard in later 2001, early 2002, I immediately wanted to translate it. I read two pages standing there in the bookstore and knew in my gut I had to translate it. Hmm. Um, it wasn't the subject matter. It was, again, the, the artistry, the sentences, the sound of the sentences that attracted me to it. It took me six years and 40 publishers to find a publisher for it. Oh. And it happened to be a, a young editor by the name of Paul Taunton at Random House who wrote to me and asked if the project was still available. And I went to see him and sort of made the whole pitch about Adler. And the hook in my pitch letter was indeed Sebald. Mm-hmm. And what I didn't know was that he was a huge Sebald fan. And so that was what got Adler to rent to, to the editor, which got Adler to Random House and, and the rest of the novels published. So after all those letters and all those attempts, you still 
stuck with it. Who were you translating really uh, Inge- for? Ingeborg Bachmann. I had, uh-huh. I had spent about 20 years tr- translating Bachmann's uh, collected poems and a couple of novels of her, and I did a few other books uh, by other German writers too. But I was kind of hunting around for a new translation project. I'm not someone who who uh, sort of translates anything that's sent along to me. I don't think of myself as a professional translator in that way. I'm a writer who happens to translate. And it was when I, I read those pages of Die Reise that I was just hooked. And why I kept at it, I'm an awfully stubborn person, I suppose. And I just, I could feel it in my gut that there was something there and it was worth pursuing. It's incredible. But bringing up Sebald is, is also a very good way to talk about the book that he's was best known for his book on Theresienstadt, which was a sociological study published in 1955, which I think could plausibly be called the beginning of Holocaust studies. Sure. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Yeah, it's an amazing book. Uh, it is available in English now. Cambridge University Press published uh, Belinda Cooper's translation of it in t- 2016. In the original German version, it's about a thousand pages long. It is full with every detail you need to know about Theresienstadt. Uh, Adler began working on the book when he was in Theresienstadt for 32, 32 months through his wife, Gertrude uh, Klepetar, who, who was head of the uh, medical laboratory there. He had access to many uh, administrative documents that the Nazis and the Jewish administration were circling at the time, and he kept taking them and uh, stuffing them away and hiding them in her library. When, after the war, he went back and collected these documents, he basically walked out of the camp with the next 40 years of his life between those documents and the 130 poems that he had written there and uh, several short stories, the beginnings of a novel. But it took him till 1955 to find a publisher and for it to be published. It is a historical account of Theresienstadt, as a historical account of the setting up of Theresienstadt and the uh, menacing philosophy of the Nazis behind it. But it is also soup to nuts of what happened on a daily basis, what were the statistics for food, for work, for housing, for uh, health every possible angle you can imagine. And then towards the end, in the last section of it, is basically an essay about meditating about Theresienstadt's place in modernity. The author did not feel that Theresienstadt and the Holocaust was something limited to the Nazis. He saw it, saw it as a natural, unnatural, but uh, uh, palpable outcome of the modern bureaucratic state, which turns human, human beings into objects. And that last uh, section is really a sort of critique of modernity on the whole, uh, not just a history of Theresienstadt. So it's both it's history, it's sociol- sociology, and psychology. And in fact, those are the three main parts that he breaks the book up into. And that also connects to his final book that he's also, I think, somewhat known for, yeah. Administered Man. Yes. Which is published in the, in the 70s? Yes. Uh, it's 1974. He spends 15 years working on it. And that is a study of the entire deportation system, whereas the Theresienstadt book is specifically focused on Theresienstadt. He only tells of his experience in a, a note at the back of the book. And he thought of the Theresa Stott book, uh, the writing of it, as an act of self-liberation. The administered man was an act of scholarship mm-hmm. and, and that to employ the methods that he developed in the Theresa Stott book to a study of the entire deportation system, the, again, philosophy behind it and the consequences of it for modern life after the war. And again, the final part of Administered Man is a real interrogation of modernity and its bureaucratic underpinnings. He's such an interesting writer because it seems like he, I mean, he writes so philosophically at times. And you think especially the last part of the Theresienstadt book, I mean, as you're you're pointing out that it's not a coda exactly, but that it's it's a very philosophical uh, meditation. And and clearly he's a writer of ideas in many ways. Yes, very much. In that regard. But it meets up with this very dispassionate student of product of sociological thinking, which is so, which also seems to be somewhat, um, sui generis, I think, with Adler, or at least that's my sense of it. Yes, and I, th- I think the one other element I would add in there is the the eye of the fiction writer. He said of the Tradition Stop book that he thought of it as a Kafka novel, lively and engaging, but with reverse signification, meaning that Kafka is looking at the everyday world and seeing it as a nightmare. And Adler is writing about the everyday world in front of him, which is in fact a nightmare um, in his nightmarish and its qualities. So he saw it almost as a mirror image of a Kafka novel. And throughout the Theresienstadt book, you see the eye of a writer focusing on particular details and rendering them in quite vivid and exacting dramatic fashion. In the novels, you have a 
artistic writer who is taking a step back and reflecting philosophically upon his experience. So the two mesh together. And I do think this is unique. Um, many writers, of course, write essays and, some, and sometimes memoirs and sometimes studies of other writers. But there are very, very few writers who've done that kind of deep dive, serious scholarship. Elias Canetti is one who comes to mind. Another was Adler's dear childhood friend, Franz uh, Berman Steiner, who wrote a dissertation on slavery um, at Oxford, but died young, but at the same time was a very gifted poet. And um, had many, many literary connections as well. Very much. Uh, Iris Murdoch uh, was very close. In fact, he, he had proposed marriage to Iris Murdoch, uh, Steiner did. But Adler, I think, is, again, one of these unique kinds of minds who is able to fuse the fictive and the factual in very interesting, intricate ways. His pursuit was to tell the truth, and to do that meant nailing down exactly what happened in his experience in both Theresienstadt and the other camps, and then nailing down the experience of the entire deportation system, but also then rendering it artistically, because you, you can't have the entire truth without the imagination. Well, one of the images, I mean, you, you mentioned Kafka in particular in that context, and uh, and Kafka is so important to him. And one of the images, or the image that the book begins with, is such a Kafka esque image. I yeah. mean, I hate to use that that word, no. but um, but it's but it's really an incredible story. You reproduce a note card uh, dated. I believe it, the note card is dated, but we know that it was used in a talk on July third, nineteen forty three, right at Theresienstadt. Um, can you give the context of that way that you start your book? Well, yes. I think the first thing to say is to remember that Theresienstadt was a place full of culture. There were concerts, there were poetry readings, there were uh, plays, there was opera. The, um, and that was part of the grotesqueness of the experience, which drove Adler mad. But he did propose to give an array of lectures to the Leisure Activities Committee. And on October 3rd, 1943, which was the 60th birthday, Franz Kafka's 60th birthday, he gives a lecture in honor, on Kafka, in honor of Kafka, to about 100 people in one of the barracks, and one of whom was Otili. Uh, Kafka, Kafka's favorite sister. And at the end of the lecture, she comes forward and says, on behalf of the family, I wish to thank you. And then repeated the lecture. It was so popular, repeated the lecture a few days later uh, in one of the other venues. But I started there because it seemed to me everything in Adler's life, he would have been 30, just turned 33 the day before. Everything in his life kind of led up to that point. I mean, the bizarreness. It was, I'm convinced, the only lecture on Kafka's 60th birthday in in any of the German occupied countries who would be so crazy as to give a lecture on Kafka who was banned by the Nazis whose books were burned and that the only lecture on Kafka in German happens in Theresienstadt of all places and that it's also a combination that with the fact, very fact that we have the note, the miraculousness of this material coming back out of Theresienstadt and Adler was amazing at keeping hold of his materials and cataloging them and preserving them, uh, and which, of course, end up in the archives. So I had a tremendous amount of material to work with, tremendous access to this material. So it starts kind of the archival life of the book, too. And fortunately, he used the typewriter a lot because I understand his, his handwriting was not so yeah, helpful. Yeah, he was, no. I mean, there was a, a centenary for Adler at the Deutsches Literaturarchiv in Marbach, Germany in 2010, and I was invited to speak there. That was after the journey had come out, and I did a talk about translating the journey. But I actually went two days early because I had the idea then of writing a biography and raced through his archive to see what was there and discovered that probably 98, 99% of it was typed. He was born a lefty, forced to become a righty at a young age in, in grammar school, which was common back then. And his handwriting was so bad that his his parents and, and his family couldn't read it. So uh, as an adolescent, he, he begins typing all this, his work. He had access to a typewriter in Theresienstadt because of Gertrude, his wife. And every letter he wrote from there on out post-war was all typed. And what's really amazing is that there are very few crossings out or corrections in the letters. And the letters are sort of left to right, top to bottom, solid uh, text. He would indicate a paragraph break with a double slash. And this came from needing to preserve of paper in Theresienstadt, needing to preserve paper in, in the penury uh, that he, he, he lived in uh, in post-war England. Yeah, you have to remind people who were born after a certain yeah. certain date <laughs> that, uh, that actually typing without corrections on paper is rare yes. and hard to achieve. Exactly. He, he just 
had a way of things just spilling out of him. He was a prolific letter writer. He wrote 10 to 15 pages of letters for uh, 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, to, and, of course, when he was back in Germany doing his research for Administered Man over a course of 15 years, he was writing his second wife, Bettina Gross, back in London. And this was a great boon for me as a biographer to, to have the intimate talk of husband and wife in letters uh, on a daily basis for months and months at a time. After the war, he survived Auschwitz. Yeah. He survived the other two camps. Mm. He makes it back to Prague, which is where he, where he grew up, and reconnects with someone he knew before the war and, and eventually makes his way to England, and they're married. Yep. And then he has to live really a very difficult life for the next seven years, which is also another incredible story of struggle and survival and his, his just will to make sure that this story is told. Yes. He gets back to, to Prague in June of uh, 1945. He and Bettina Gross connect through the mail uh, miraculously in November uh, 1945. Their letters, first letters to each other crossing in the mail. She having gained his address in Prague, he having gained her address in, in South Wales at the time. And, and then within six weeks, he proposes marriage to her in a letter and she accepts. Her mother had been in Theresienstadt with Adler and then perished in Auschwitz just a few days before Adler and Gertrude were shipped there in 1944. So he proposes marriage to her, but it takes until February of 1947 before he gets a visa and is able to leave Czechoslovakia, comes to England. And rather than take any kind of a job, he was so committed to writing the Theresienstadt book that he refused. People said he should work as a waiter in a wine restaurant or take up work as a gardener. He did a little bit of tutoring here and there. He did apply for some university jobs, but wasn't well known enough, wasn't published enough to gain uh, such a position. And instead, they had he had a little bit of money from some stamps that his father had hid away during the war, and Bettina had saved some money from the work she did in South Wales during the war. But they lived in absolute penury. I mean, there's really hand to mouth. Uh, their son, Jeremy, was born in 19, October 1947, so they had a little boy to care for. And it really was not until 1955 and, and the publication of the Theresa's that book. It took that long for their fortunes to turn. And you have to remember, he was 45 years old at the time. Mm. The book is a real reminder of how long it took before people were ready to hear anything about the Holocaust to start to uh, understand what had transpired. Yes. I mean, you know, it's we know this now, but it's still kind of hard to appreciate. It really is not until the Frankfurt Auschwitz trials of 1963 to 1965. It's really not until Eichmann is, is arrested in the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem that there's an open discussion of the Holocaust. Obviously, parents of children were not saying what had happened or or what had happened to so-and-so or, or who, you know, in the neighborhood who had disappeared. Um, Adler had a hand in the, in this changing uh, in uh, co-producing a three-and-a-half-hour radio show on Auschwitz, which included survivor first-person accounts, uh, actors playing the parts of Nazis who had been uh, tried and executed. And this uh, ran in October of 1961, and it was a riveting moment for Germany. Germany. Um, you have to remember that the radio, rather than the television, was the primary medium of the time. And the culture that was listened to and projected on German radio was extremely sophisticated. And this broadcast was groundbreaking in itself. It was reissued in 2015, uh, the, what, uh, 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz um, on a CD and played again on the uh, Westdeutsche Rundfunk. So he had a hand in trying to bring the awareness to, to, to the public. And this is just before the Eichmann trial? It's just before the trial, yes, uh, because it was partially... But Eichmann had been, had been arrested. He'd been arrested, that's right. Um, and part of the reason that they had put this material together was to provide uh, materials for the prosecution of Eichmann in Jerusalem. So these were handed over to the state's attorney general and used in, in the trial itself. And I, I won't go into great detail about it, but he did have a somewhat um, difficult relationship, or public at least, with Hannah Arendt. Yeah, I mean, Eichmann in Jerusalem, of course, came out in The New Yorker initially and then was published as a book in English. 
it was not until it was translated into German that he felt he should weigh in because he, by then he was an acknowledged public intellectual. He, as I said earlier, produced radio programs, but he also wrote for the radio uh, very frequently. He had become known, if you will, as Theresienstadt Adler because he did a lot of lectures in Germany, Switzerland, at Jew Jewish community centers, various conferences. So he had a certain position and felt that he should weigh in and was asked to weigh in. He had a real problem with Arant's loose handling of the facts, which others have uh, criticized her for. And he also felt that she had quoted from and used materials by Eugen Kogon, another Holocaust scholar, and himself. Um, she does acknowledge him in the book, but he felt that she had gone too far. Mm. And so he writes a blistering attack on her and uh, publishes it in a German newspaper. Was weiß Hannah Arant über den Showa, I think it is. And and uh, does a half-hour radio program sort of uh, leveling her, too. <laughs> Um, he, his other connections was that way, way back, he had been in correspondence with Hermann Broch in Princeton. This is in 1949 and trying to get his Theresienstadt book published in English first. That's what he thought would happen get it, for it to be translated and that it might appear at American academic press. And Broch reached out to Hannah Arendt um, and sent her the manuscript. And she indeed tried to help him find a publisher too. So there was a positive relationship early on and a more critical one in the mid-1960s. By that time, and then a little bit later, Adler's a very well-known figure in Germany, or decently well-known. Decently well-known, I would say, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, more, again, as Theresienstadt, not as a novelist, but known as Theresienstadt Adler, he, he gives dozens of public talks per year, writes dozens of radio essays each year. It's primarily how he makes his living between 1956 and the mid-70s when German radio began to retreat and economize and pay much smaller fees than they used to. But he earned quite a good living by that and became very well known for it. Did he ever return to Germany? He did not live in, or not return to Germany. Did he ever, did he ever move to Germany? I no, say. he said quite openly he would not live in a country that Hitler had once occupied. He had no problem being in Germany for two to four months a year during those years of research for administered man. He always thought of himself as a German writer. He always wrote in German, even after his move to London. German was the language of the household in London. He had no particular animus to the German people, if you will. His animus was to Nazi bureaucracy, which he still encountered in, in struggles to get hold of materials for administered man. He felt at times that as a Jewish scholar and survivor, he was uh, not to be trusted. That he, his, somehow his view was, was too skewed and too subjective. But these were issues with particular aspects of the German government and the German past, not the language, which he loved and took very, very seriously, and not with the people and its culture. Do you know if there's any um, likelihood that uh, your biography will be translated into German? We're very ho much hoping so, and 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 um, we're already you know sort of making the first forays or moves to to see if that happened. I would th I would think it would happen. Um, there are scholars already over there saying we need this uh, in, to have it in German, and and I'm very hopeful that it will be. Could you ever have imagined when you uh, first picked up that book <laughs> in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, that? Uh, that you would be dedicating this much of your the rest of your life? No, to, no. Uh, uh, you, I mean, or the the twenty years to come. <laughs> exactly right. No, obviously I couldn't. I had no idea. Um, I I do know. I can still feel in my gut the power of that prose upon me and those years of you know belief in in uh, in his work and trying to find a publisher for it. You know, writing the biography, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. I, I will say that, you know, the amount of research that it took. And certainly in, in the midst of any project like that, one can grow tired at times, but I never grew tired of it and am and, and still not. The, the fascination of a, of a single life, which was so much always in the middle of things and always on the margin of historical uh, importance, that combination sort of really fascinated me all the way through and trying to depict that kind of marginality but centrality at the same time was, was fascinating for me. Coming out of it on the other end, do you now feel more like you want to turn to a new translation or 
Are you ready to get out of the biography business for a bit? Yeah, I think so. I'm a writer of poems. That's how I think of myself when Mm -hmm. I get up in the morning. And I've uh, actually just finished a new collection, which I'm really excited about. And, you know, I kind of spent 20 years on Ingeborg Bachmann and 20 years on uh, H.G. Adler. Um, I wouldn't mind having 20 years on uh, Filkins if I got a chance to. (laughs) (laughs) But I would do another biography. If this right subject came along, there are only two conditions. One is that it it be an American or Englishman such that all the documents are in English because I had to translate all the documents for this. Mm -hmm. And two, that the archive be stateside, that I don't have to travel and be be away from home as much as I had to be for this book. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful book. Uh, The title is H.G. Adler, A Life in Many Worlds, and uh, the author is Peter Filkins. And Peter, thank you very much. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU and the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. This episode was produced by Micah Hazel. You can find us on Stitcher, iTunes, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more information, visit us at www.nyihumanities.org.